Here's the difference between that epidural and subdural hematoma. Uh, the epidural, as I've already told you, it involves arteries, the middle meningeal artery being the most. So that is going to end up happening very rapidly, and they have periods of lucid interval. If we look at the right side of the screen, that is going to be because of bleeding from bridging veins. And veins don't bleed as rapidly. It is going to be a slow bleeding, a slow progression over several days. And then you're, what, what you're going to end up seeing and what the history and physical here is going to be is, you know, granny fell about a week ago. Um, she had a headache over the last couple of days and she didn't want to go to the hospital. We came over to check on her today and now we find her unresponsive. The reality is she probably has had a subdural hematoma over the last seven days. She just didn't know it and nobody did until she became unconscious, which is what led her to the hospital and ultimately a CAT scan. With subarachnoid hemorrhage, this is between the pia mater and the arachnoid space. Um, this is also an artery involvement, so it is going to be a faster onset, and it's from the vertebral artery. Um, and the signs and symptoms here, and I have seen this probably in fairness, probably 10 times in my career um, in the emergency department or in EMS, and they always say the same thing, and that is absolutely true there in quotations. It is the worst headache of my life. Um, if you have somebody tell you that, um, you should be suspecting that it could be a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, in addition to that, with vomiting, they will have projectile vomiting. So literally, if they are laying supine in your ambulance and they vomit, it is not uh, too far-fetched that the vomitus would hit the ceiling of the ambulance. Um, that has been done. I have seen that done. Um, so projectile vomiting is one of those things uh, that you may end up finding in a patient that, in fact, has a head bleed. Monroe Kelly doctrine, I've always thought that this is very interesting. Here's kind of the root. You only have so much room within your cranial vault for the expansion of something, right? So if blood, brain, or CSF, which are the three things that should be inside that cranial vault, if one goes up, then you have to have a loss in something else. So if I take a baseball bat and I hit somebody in the head with it and they have brain swelling, then I know the brain's increasing. I have to lose blood and CSF, which is why we end up teaching that you should see otorrhea or rhinorrhea. So you're going to end up having that leakage of fluid from either the, the, uh, the nose or the ears. And that's simply because it is escaping out because there's no room for it there. If this patient has a head bleed, now all of a sudden I have more bleeding or more blood inside the cranial vault, I have to lose something else. So I'm going to lose CSF and or brain. And this is where herniation comes in. Uh, we'll end up herniating our brain stem. It goes through the foramen magnum, which is the, the opening or the bridging point between the brain and the uh, spinal column. And that is where we're going to end up herniating from. And obviously with that, we're going to see a bunch of different changes as far as our respiratory patterns, et cetera. So as intracranial pressure goes up, cerebral blood flow decreases, and that's just because it has to overcome a higher pressure. So the compensatory mechanisms here uh, try to make things better, and that's where we end up getting Cushing's triad. And if you've never seen this before, I promise you, if you are paying attention, you can certainly find this in the pre-hospital setting. I have seen it in the back of an ambulance more than once. So increased blood pressure because you have to overcome that high pressure to get blood flow up there. And then they're going to end up when they start to herniate and they put pressure through that foramen magnum. That's the medulla oblongata where we control our cardiac and respiratory centers. And because of that, we're going to have a reduction in heart rate and erratic respirations because it is putting pressure at the base of the brain. Hypercarbia. So if we have an increase in CO2, CO2 is a potent vasodilator, and that is a bad thing in patients that have head injuries or a suspected increased intracranial pressure. So we want to make sure that we are blowing off some of their CO2, which is why we really should have these people on capnography, and we should keep their end title to a lower level, somewhere around 30 to 35, which is what we should be guiding for. That all has to do with the vasodilatory um, abilities of the entitled CO2 and what hypercarbia is going to do for your patient. Here's the herniation I was talking about. So down here at the bottom, you can see that's the foramen magnum. That is where the spinal cord and the base of the brain basically attach. And in time, 
if I put too much blood inside the cranial vault, then the brain is going to start pushing down through the frame and magnum. If I have too much brain inside the cranial vault, then I'm going to end up losing blood or CSF through the frame and magnum. And I'm also going to lose those through the nasal cavity and the ears, which is where our rhinorrhea and otorrhea come from.